Welcome to Hollywood Crime Scene. I am Joe Hollywood, and I am joined by Imaginos Pete. Hello, hello. And do we have a new nickname this week? Nick, what's what's a good uh, political name for me? <laughs> the Honorable <laughs> Andrew Walker. Yeah, there you go. We can, we, we can do that. The Honorable. What, what about what about uh, the best friend of the the Cherokee, Andrew Jackson? <laughs> President Andrew Jackson. There yeah. you go. All right. An, an ironic that's... name, but sh- oh, sure. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> we have fun. Right, right. So we dropped a little hint there that, uh, of course, the midterm elections are right around the corner. So we thought we'd go with a, a political theme today, uh, corruption, uh, anarchy, mayhem, and even murder. Oh. No. <laughs> Isn't it sad that the first thing when you hear political, you think corruption instead of like it goes hand in hand, doing something yeah. hand in hand. Maybe and maybe Hollywood had a little bit to do with that, with a lot of movies that focus on that topic. Um, as I was doing research for today's topic, I discovered that uh, corruption and politics in Hollywood goes way back to its founding, uh, since its earliest days, L.A. had a reputation for being the wickedest town in America. Uh, It was like a lawless town. And the funny thing is, is that during its founding in those early days, there were no laws on the books. So they just did what they did and thought that's just the way it is. And then laws came later to kind of address this sort of thing. So it's just the way things went. Uh, One story that I read in 1855 uh, L.A. Mayor Stephen C. Foster resigned from office so he could join a mob who lynched a convicted murderer, Dave Brown. Uh, Dave Brown was uh, convicted of murder and originally was supposed to get uh, the death sentence, uh, hung, I guess, at the time. Uh, but they found out that the California Supreme Court had issued a stay of execution which meant they were going to postpone his death sentence. So the mayor resigned, formed a mob, and took it into his own hands and hung the guy uh, from the scaffold. And nice. the consequence? He was reelected the following year. Wow. <laughs> so it was just the will of the people, I guess. You know, And, and that's one thing I've learned about uh, corruption is that a lot of times the corruption is sort of uh, directed – at the criminal element, um, even though I'm sure innocent people fell victim to it. But a lot of times it was directed toward the criminal element. And most people were like, well, I don't care. It, you know, it's he had it coming, I guess. Um, in 1906, Arthur Harper was elected mayor of L.A. Uh, during his tenure, the, uh, the city took protection money from brothels, casinos, saloons, all while he would go in front of the press and claim that he was cleaning up this town. And uh, when he was accused of visiting Madame Pearl Morton's brothel, uh, he defended himself by saying he was on a fact-finding mission. <laughs> uh, things don't change all that much. No, today. those sound like those. <laughs> yeah, wow. <laughs> That's hilarious. The Los Angeles Herald newspaper exposed him. And facing a recall, he resigned in 1909. Uh, but it just kept going. People don't learn. You know, uh, this, this could apply to the Detroit City Council. Like, people keep getting arrested and accused on the Detroit City Council, but it doesn't seem to end. They keep doing it for some reason. Like, it it doesn't apply to me. Yeah. Well, also, it's not my guy that's corrupt. It's your guy that's corrupt. Yeah. You could look at... You know what, Congress. Congress has a low approval rating, but they keep getting reelected because it's not my, my guy's not the problem. It's your guy in your yeah. district and your state. Yeah, I, I just read something recently that a guy running for uh, reelection said, "I have a plan to to fix all the problems that uh, our community's facing," and uh, he's been in office thirty years, so it's like. Who's causing these problems? Where are these plans you're talking about? That's when you have some heckler in the crowd. So then step down. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, that's politics for you. Uh, in 1915, Charles E. Sebastian was elected mayor. 
Uh, he was connected to that previous administration where the guy was forced to resign, the Harper administration. Uh, before being elected, he was indicted for beating a homeless man months before the election. Still got elected. Uh, what brought him down, though, was, of course, a sex scandal. Uh, right. Violence against the homeless. <laughs> right. <laughs> that but sex- morals. Yeah. Huh. I'm clutching my pearls. <laughs> Um, so someone got their hands on a letter he had written to his mistress, Lillian Pratt, uh, in which, in the letter, he called his wife an old hay bag and wrote of buying his mistress lavish gifts. He claimed, of course, that uh, that was a forgery that never happened, but he ended up resigning. Uh, so you got to throw that sex scandal in there, too. But nothing compared to the 1920s with Prohibition. Uh. That's when things went off the charts. Uh, There's a guy named Kent Parrott. I love that name. This is ripe for a movie, isn't it? Kent Kent Parrott. Parrott, like, like... It sounds like a radio announcer. <laughs> right. Some noir film, you know. Uh, he was chief of staff to Mayor George Cryer. He partnered with gangster Good Time Charlie Crawford. I'm not making this up. Uh, to rule over the LAPD and City Hall, bootleggers and gangsters flourished under police protection. Uh, so as long as they got their cut, as long as they got yeah. uh, their slice, uh, the things just flourished while uh, the LAPD was like, oh, we're, we're here to serve and protect. So in the City of Angels, it's better to be on the right hand of the devil than in front of them. Right, fair <laughs> enough. That's right. Uh, They say corruption peaked in L.A. in 1933 under Frank Shaw. Now, this is kind of interesting. A cafeteria owner named Clifford Clinton launched an investigation to expose corruption. Now, why a cafeteria owner? What authority did he have? Interestingly, though, my friend Sherry, who lives in L.A., uh, took me to a restaurant just a few years ago. I think it was 2019 called... Clifton's. And I'm like, is there a connection? Well, yes. Clifford Clinton combined Clifford and Clinton to form (laughs) Clifton's and he started a chain of restaurants and I didn't realize that I had eaten at one of his restaurants and it's a really cool place. There's multi-levels with really crazy taxidermy and and, uh, interior design. It's really remarkable. (laughs) Uh, So this guy took it upon himself to expose corruption uh, in October of 1937, Clinton's home in Los Feliz, I like to say Los Feliz, but apparently the locals say Los Feliz, yeah. uh, his home was bombed, uh, no one was hurt, uh, but a car with a license plate tied to the LAPD was seen fleeing the scene, of course. And then in January of 1938, private detective, private detective Harry Raymond's car exploded when he turned the key. Three policemen with ties to City Hall were convicted of attempted murder. So this is this is the stuff you see in movies. I mean, you don't think, wow, this stuff didn't happen in real life. But yeah, yeah, this was this was at its peak in the thirties. It's a kernel of truth to most things. Yeah. So in nineteen thirty eight, this Shaw guy became the only LA mayor ever to be recalled because of Clinton's ef- uh, efforts. And he was convicted of 63 counts of selling government jobs. So L.A. has a long history of, of political corruption and schemes and kickbacks and bribes and all sorts of stuff. And uh, since I was in that frame of mind, I decided to sit down and watch what I think is one of the best movies ever about uh, L.A. Corruption, L.A. Confidential. Ah, lovely, uh, great movie. Came out in 1997. One of the most amazing casts, and this was all fairly early in their career, uh, stars Kevin Spacey, Russell Crowe, Guy Pearce, and Kim Basinger uh, as a Veronica Lake yeah. lookalike. Um, and James Cromwell, who up until that point was known as a you know, good guy from Babe, you know, that right, sort of thing. Yeah. He was cast as the police captain, I think it was. I think that was America's first exposure to Guy Pierce and Russell Crowe. They didn't really yeah. know them too much. Outside. They were two Aussies yeah. who uh, came over to be in this film and had to protect their American accents. Um, but, oh, what a great film about corruption yeah. with twists and turns. And they make uh, 
references to some of the topics that we've talked about on this podcast before. Uh, Mickey Cohen, yep. uh, Johnny Stampanato. Uh, they have that amazing scene in uh, the Formosa, which is one of my favorite restaurants in L.A., where the cops go in to, to talk to uh, Johnny Stampanato, and uh, he's sitting with uh, someone who looks like uh, Ava Gar- or uh, Lana Turner. Lana Turner, yep. And the uh, the one detective uh, insults her and says, you know, a hooker cut to look like uh, Lana Turner is still a hooker, and, and Kevin Spacey's character says, no, that is Lana Turner. And uh, she throws a drink in his face. That's one of my favorite moments. That was filmed on location at the Formosa. I saw other locations that I'm familiar with, like uh, the Frolic Room, which is on Hollywood Boulevard, right next to the Pantages Theater. Uh, So really cool locations that really captured the vibe of the 50s era, Los Angeles. And uh, I think by the time the 50s rolled around, I I think um, the corruption had died down a little bit, but the movie did a, a great job of depicting oh, yeah. uh, that. And the title LA Confidential is based on uh, scandal magazines of the time, which in the film was called Hush Hush. Yeah. Um, but there was a real life magazine called Confidential. And there was another one uh, kind of a scandal rag called Hollywood Confidential. So the title of the movie is based on these scandal rags that would it, try to expose actors. It was a good book movies. series. It was that quartet series that yeah. LA Quartet that Black Dahlia was I think we've talked about that was one of them. So yeah, yeah that was it was very well done. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to uh, read some of those other books because uh, L.A. Confidential is one of my favorite movies. Just great performances. And, and Kim uh, Basinger, is it Basinger? Ba- ba- I, I think it's Basinger. That's how I uh, heard it, Basinger. Yeah, she she won an Oscar for her yep. role as uh, the wow. hooker with the heart of gold. <laughs> um, another great movie about L.A. corruption is Chinatown. came out yeah. in 1974 starring Jack Nicholson, uh, Faye Dunaway, and the legendary John Huston. And the interesting thing about that movie, I love the movie, but I can't, I, I can, I have to admit, I don't fully understand what the hell is happening in that movie. And I think about a quote that I heard from somebody. I, I, I don't know if it was John Houston or maybe the director of Casablanca or whatever, but somebody said, uh, the audience doesn't necessarily have to be able to follow the plot as long as they're enjoying the ride and having a good time. And I'm like, you know what? I kind of agree with yeah. that. It's a very convoluted plot, Chinatown, with, again... Uh, 1974. In the mm-hmm. 70s, you can't have a happy ending. Yeah, It was yeah. taboo until Star Wars, pretty much. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Especially anything with uh, Jack Nicholson. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, Jack, do you ever make a happy movie just yeah. once? Oh, he was so great in that. Oh, yeah. So amazing. Whatever and, happened to that dude? Yeah, whatever he, became still, of that. <laughs> no, no, Picking no, out... Uh, court side at the lakers games oh, yeah. <laughs> eating hot dogs yeah oh that was that was great um but yeah that like revolved around payoffs for water rights yep. and uh i'm like okay i don't know what's going on but the, I'm, I'm enjoying the ride the, the plot of that is similar to i think i might have mentioned this a while ago uh, roger rabbit that is next on my list oh. who framed roger rabbit 1988 with bob hoskins christopher lloyd is uh, judge doom and oh, yeah very yeah. similar storyline about payola and and trying to buy up property so they can build the freeway the old uh, old la yeah 1940s about yeah, as a matter of fact, LA Confidential has a scene where they're talking about uh, putting in the uh, the freeway, and they're buying up property. I, so I um, still still need to watch it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, so Who Framed Roger Rabbit? It has the same sort of uh, vibe as Chinatown and LA Confidential, and uh, just a, a great, great, entertaining movie. You know, Joe, you were saying there's uh, sorry, I mean there's a m- movie called See How They Run that just came out, uh, and it. Uh, Adrian Brody plays a director who's trying to direct Mousetrap, uh-huh. and he mentions something because there's an d- argument with the with the writer, and he goes, "It's it's like Hitchcock. People only remember the last twenty minutes anyway. <laughs> That's so, right. The audience only remembers the last twenty minutes, so don't worry about it. Yeah, the big twist at the end. That's <laughs> usually the third act. You know, I've I've seen enough movies where I I have pretty much expect you know the first act where you get to know the characters and everything. Then there's always that dark middle act." Where people fight and bicker and argue and there, and it has always that takes a dark turn, and then the resolution in the third act, which usually involves some sort of twist, and everyone remembers the twist, right? Yeah. The big twist at the end, and uh, all of these movies have uh, have that uh, that reveal, the big reveal, 
And then, of course, a Hollywood movie that's not necessarily set in Hollywood, but it's all about political corruption, is uh, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, oh, yeah. uh, 1939, starring Jimmy Stewart, uh, Gene, Arthur, or Gene Arthur, and uh, the great Claude Rains, who's just terrific in everything he does. He was in yeah. Casablanca and yep. uh, the uh, Meryl Flynn uh, Robin Hood. And, yeah, 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 he was just great in everything. And, and, you know, I remember the first time I watched it, which wasn't, too long ago, probably within the last 10 years or so. And I was heartbroken broken to realize that, you know, this movie was made in 1939, and a lot of that political corruption that you saw in the film still is taking place today. And I'm like, why aren't people learning? Why aren't people evolving? You know, he, he goes into Washington as this naive, idealistic politician who was appointed to fill a vacancy. He wanted to have a, a Boy Scout camp built or something and he had a hero that he wanted to emulate and this hero stabbed him in the back and they smeared his name and i'm like oh my god and it was a lot of the same stuff we see today it just never seems to change it never seems to improve i mean i remember watching the series uh john adams i think it was on yeah. HBO, hbo years yeah. ago paul giamatti and man right at the the foundation of our nation there was backstabbing and political oh, rivalries always and, is. oh my gosh so it's always been a thing uh andrew you got a you got a political corruption movie you want to talk about joe uh i'm sure there's some evidence uh d d dug underground about uh, a quarter mile from here <laughs> and we're talking about mr jimmy hoffa folks detroit's own jimmy hoffa Speaking of Nicholson, uh, he had a little makeup job to play uh, Hoffa. I have not yeah. seen that. You haven't seen the movie the, Hoffa? The, the Oliver Stone? Yeah. Yeah. Have not. Yeah. I um, I don't know, you know how it rates with fact versus fiction. And I don't even, was any of it filmed in Detroit? I think there might have been some scenes uh, filmed uh, in Detroit. There were a few. There were a few. Like in downtown filmed. Detroit. I, I definitely yeah. need to check it out. Yeah. But, but yeah, it, Joe uh, and Nick, whenever we couple weeks ago when we were talking about what to do for this episode i thought i'm going to do what i do on every episode try to hook in the detroit yeah. angle of whatever the topic is and one of you two or maybe i came up with it myself i don't know but i figured hey why not it's literally in our backyard <laughs> jimmy hoffa yeah so uh the hollywood connection i thought about was i know hoffa was made but like i said i haven't seen it uh i was thinking of the irishman mm -hmm. um uh, the Scorsese film yeah. with Robert De Niro playing uh, Frank the Irishman Sheeran and uh, De Niro playing Hoffa. Now, have, did, remind me, did you guys see this? I did not. Mm -hmm. I did not see the Irishman. I've heard good things, except that it was really, really long. Three and a half hours, my friend. <laughs> but it is excellent. Yeah. I would say split it up over three nights. Do an hour yeah. and ten minutes a night. Excellent, excellent movie. Um I believe some of it was shot around here, but I know uh, the location where he um, disappeared from the old uh, Red Fox on Telegraph. Yeah, they filmed. Is it Andiamo's now? Yep. Is that what it is? Yeah, Andiamo's yeah, yeah. right, right there at uh, Maple, I think mm -hmm. Maple and Telegraph. They shot that in California, and it looks nothing like. Uh. I was, I said, Scorsese, who is your location now? <laughs> My gosh, um, yeah. but there are other, like at least visual representations of of the 1970s right detroit anyway um excellent movie but yeah I, I i i think it's a fascinating case i think it's ripe that we could still to this day kind of discover stuff and maybe talk to some people who are kids of people who were alive and knew the Hoffa oh there themselves. are many many people yeah. here in this town and uh, i that think knew him. i think hey it's ripe for a, a group project if, ever, if anyone <laughs> listening out there is involved Let's work on a Hoffa project. I think in, in, in about 10 to 15 years, there's going to be several deathbed confessions about people. Well, any time now, because that yeah. was in 1975 when he yeah. disappeared. Yeah. 1982, I just read, and I didn't know this, when he was actually pronounced dead, because there's no possible way he can be alive that long. So, uh, just going over his Wikipedia page, yeah, there there are people who have confessed things, but so far they've been wild goose chases, but... I think 
the truth almost always comes out about stuff like that, or at least it, it comes close. Man. See, there was a guy uh, just a few years ago. I want to say 2014, 2015, something like that. There was a guy who claimed to know the story, and he was known as sort of a big mouth, sort of a rat, sort of a guy. And I don't think they would have given him that information. And so he claimed that he that he knew that Hoffa was buried. Uh, at Orion and Adams Road, uh, a few miles from where we're sitting right now. Yeah. And they started digging up that property. They found like this concrete slab, which I think used to be the floor of a barn or some sort of a structure. They lifted up that concrete slab, dug underneath it, and found absolutely no evidence that anyone had ever been buried there. And I feel like they deliberately, knowing that this guy was sort of a big mouth, that they may have fed him misinformation, knowing that he might talk, which is exactly what he did, yeah. and it led to a big nothing burger. But here's kind of a neat little story. Um, so when that dig was happening, I went over to the site. I shot some video, interviewed the sheriff, and I had heard that Hoffa lived here in Orion Township when we were recording this podcast. And so I reached out to Township Hall, and I said, I don't suppose you happen to know the address, do you? And they said, yep, and they gave me the address. And they said, be careful because the guy who lives there doesn't like trespassers yeah, on his property. Imagine. So I drove. I, I First, I sat down at my desk, and I typed in the address, and the Google map that came up, the, the directions were only a few inches long. I'm like, what? And I realized I can walk to Hoffa's <laughs> house from here. I was shocked. When I typed in that information, it is literally within walking distance here. <laughs> so I drive, I go down the road, make a right, make a left, go down this road that had these really weird speed bumps. They were shaped like X's, and my car was just bouncing back and forth. So I get to the end of the road, see the house, sat in my car, shot some video from my car. I didn't want to confront the guy who lived there. <clears throat> and once I got some video, I turned around and came back. Well, as I was doing some research, I found a like a free press article about uh, the day after he had died. They went over there and were talking to his neighbors. What kind of guy was Hoffa? And they said, oh, he was a really great guy, very great neighbor, good, friendly guy. As a matter of fact, when we were complaining about speeders uh, on our in our neighborhood, he had his guys come in and put in these speed bumps. Okay. So those speed bumps that I was driving over were put in by Hoffa and these guys. I couldn't believe it. I'm like, that's really amazing. Um, so, yeah, so his his home is there. And I'm glad you told me that, Joe, because I was going to say, does Lake Orion have a record of those speed bumps? Because all of a sudden you're like, oh, boy. <laughs> yeah, I don't think he's buried there. That would be too obvious. Um, but I did learn something neat that the, uh, the current owner there uh, – kind of a friend of a friend met his daughter and told us that um, when the current owner moved into that house, a lot of Hoffa's artifacts were left behind. Uh, just, you know, shaving and bathroom stuff and maybe, you know, pill bottles or whatever. And he has them in a box tucked away somewhere in that home. So I'm hoping someday I might get an opportunity to get in there and, and see uh, what was happening. But um, I did find online... And again, I don't know if I can verify this or not, but there are photos of Hoffa at that home. He's posing for a photographer at the Lake Orion home. Right. Uh, and I saw a caption on one of the photos that said, taken the day he disappeared. So if you Google Jimmy Hoffa and Lake Orion and you see these photos in front of his uh, Lake Orion home, apparently these photos were taken the day he disappeared. I uh, told his wife that he had a meeting to attend, got in his car. Did I've always wanted to kind of drive that route yeah. from from his home to the Red Fox restaurant. Uh, he was supposed to meet some people there. Apparently, according to witnesses, he never went inside the restaurant. He m met up with whoever he was supposed to meet with in the parking lot. A witness saw the car driving out of the parking lot. He saw, recognized Hoffa in the back seat, and that was it. That was it. No one ever saw him again. So very cool local connection yeah. and uh, cool. right from within walking distance from where we are sitting right now. I just looked nice. it up on Google Maps, 0.9 miles. <laughs> it's, it's right between the uh, library right here on Joslin and um, <laughs> the Pollyann Trail, the old railroad track that goes right yeah. behind here. Yeah. Tell me. <laughs> That's Nick, what, what? Nick, 
We're working on a project, baby. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> let's, let's go find them. Yeah, <laughs> that's no. right. Yeah, and uh, another a little sidebar. We were talking about a Hollywood connection, and right. this is this is sort of you know rabbit hole stuff. But I had read years ago that Hoffa was partially responsible for funding Bugsy Siegel's efforts in Vegas, and that money coming from the Teamsters or was it the union that Hoffa was in yeah, charge of? Right. IBT, the International Brotherhood of Teamsters. Some of that money was used to kind of uh, kickstart Vegas, and so Hoffa played a role in, in making really? Vegas. Now, I read that from a source years ago. Again, I, I haven't heard that. I need but, verification, I mean, but there at, is a connection. At that time, when Be- when Vegas was a boom town, well, it still is a boom town, but yeah. in those days, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I'd be surprised if they weren't. Yeah. Yeah. So what what landed Hoffa in jail? Because um, he he was the president, yes. and then he went to jail, and then when he got out of jail, he tried to reassume his uh, previous position, and they said, "No, we've moved on from you." And when right. he started making a stink about it, they were like, eh, "We got uh, come meet us for lunch," and that he, was it. He, what, he do you tried... have any idea what sent him to jail initially? Um, I believe it was. Was it racketeering, tax evasion, something? That's usually how they get these guys. So you had right. a, so yeah. a RICO case against him? I think it was a RICO. Um, and he went to jail for a little bit. Uh, Nixon commuted his sentence, hmm. of course. <laughs> <laughs> great, for those who can't guy. see, there was an eye roll just now. <laughs> yeah, great guy. Um, he's the gift that keeps on giving to this day, honestly, with Roger Stone, right? Yeah. Anyway. That's another story. Um, Doesn't Roger Stone have a Nixon tattoo on his? Oh thing? yeah! <laughs> Everybody listening, Google Roger Stone's back tattoo. These are the type of people. Yeah. Anyway, he yeah. looks. He looks like a comic book villain. Yeah, yeah he's, himself, he's dressed up as the Joker in some photos. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Great guy. He's yeah, um, just leaning into it. <laughs> where was I, gentlemen? So uh, <laughs> we were talking about what sent him to jail. So it was mostly finance-related stuff. I, I, and, be- uh, I, I believe so. Yeah. And he got co- commuted. Um, when he got out, this is what I think happened, just the l- little bit of research I, I've done. Um, obviously, he would have had to rat somebody out to get commuted. Um by, he, he by, must, by he Nixon. Must, he must have had dirt on something. He did. Name names. And, and yeah, I, I think he named names once he got out and tried to get big again at a local Teamsters uh, called 2, 299. I don't know in the city where it's located or maybe it's around here. Anyway, I think somebody had enough of him because he had burned too many people with, uh, you know, naming names and, mm. and ratting that they said, hey, we can't let this guy go any further because. This is our territory. This is Detroit is our territory for the Teamsters. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and hey, he he did us bad. He's got to go. Yeah, yeah. Now some people claim <coughs> that he had a uh, he had a uh, a boat launch, sort of a boat dock uh, on Lake Orion, and but his home is actually on a lake called Long Lake. Uh, from what I read. If you did see him boating around Lake Orion, he shared a boathouse with somebody who allowed him to store his boat in their boathouse. And I remember taking a, a historical tour around the lake, and someone pointed out the boathouse and said, this is where Jimmy Hoffa housed his boat. So Now, there is a boathouse that has a big H on it, and people say, oh, that's where it was. And it's like, no, no, he, he wouldn't have had the H on the boathouse because it wasn't his. He shared it with somebody else. Um, but, yeah, there are people living here in Lake Orion today that knew him and saw him at the local bars and restaurants and saw him tooling around on, on the lake. So pretty cool. History yeah. right here in Lake Orion. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, when it comes to political corruption and, uh, and, and Hollywood, I mean, yeah, you bring, up, you bring up Hoffa. And then if we come to more modern times, I, you know, when you guys were mentioning that he got killed, it's either he ratted someone out or he knows too much information. And you can almost imagine, I mean, we talked about this before with Jeffrey Epstein. Mm-hmm. You know, all the Hollywood, everyone in Hollywood was kind of going towards him. In fact, him and Weinstein were actually friends for a while. And in the, I think in the, in the Daily Beast or in, or in um, Political, they reported that they had a falling out because Epstein got mad at Weinstein for coming after one of his girls. Mm. So you kind of see Epstein pulling a, 
the moral high ground on Weinstein here, and it's kind of weird. Like, <laughs> did, did you ever hear about Trump talking about uh, what what burned his bridge with uh, Epstein? Epstein? No. It's intimated that he came on to Ivanka. Oh well, and huh. Trump Trump was like cross the line. Eh? Yeah, <laughs> I, I figured. Which Iv- I, I figured Ivanka was too old for her, too old for more <laughs> <laughs> for Epstein. That's right. Now we all know Epstein's fate, and again, you know this this when you read it, it plays out like a movie, like yeah. all the things that had to go wrong. For them to find him in his cell. Oh, the guard wasn't on duty. The security cameras didn't work. He was already on suicide watch. He already had an attempt on, you know, he already made one attempt earlier. So this is one of those, you mentioned earlier, Joe, when people would just do naked corruption in in, in the foundation of Hollywood, the foundation of the country. And so it's the same thing here. You know, something like that happens to him and goes, oh, yeah, it's a mystery. Nobody knows what happened. Like, it's, nobody want to look into this. He just he just committed suicide. Yep. Oh, the, well. The autopsy report, nothing matters. And both guards were just asleep at the same time. <laughs> really? Now, yeah. Now, Hollywood is this corrupt, you know, creatively bankrupt. We can't come up with anything better than this, that's guys. That's how arrogant these these people are that they it, go, oh, they'll, they'll buy it. It's like they'll. the cops are driving away. Yeah. After bombing, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. so it's like you. But They're driving bomb. police cars. <laughs> like what? Like this is this Arrogant. is creatively lazy, guys. Come on, <laughs> this is uh, and Hollywood. You know, this is why I. It, it's, it, it. I mean, I'm almost at a loss of words for it. But uh, no, a political corruption, and and that's ties with Hollywood are just it, they go back to its foundation and they happen now and people don't learn because it's all about access to power and then everyone everyone wants to act like oh I don't know this guy. I never did any homework. I mean, Joe, let me ask you this. If you got invited to a party and said, and I said, hey, Joe, there's this guy, and uh, he's kind of a big wig. You know, I, I don't know too much about him, but there's going to be a lot of people there. And you'd say, all right, well, I'll meet you there, Nick. And then wouldn't you at least be curious as to who this mysterious person is? Oh, oh, where, sure. where am I going? <laughs> who owns this house? And you're like, oh, wait, this guy came up on the Google search. What, he went to prison for what? Oh, no. Yeah. Yeah, Nick, uh, I can't make it. I yeah. don't think you should go either. Yeah, the only reason someone would show up to something like that is because they're intrigued. Like, oh, he can do what now? He but, has what kind of power? And there were people meeting with Epstein after he got out of prison for. That's uh, right. In yeah. two thousand, you know, at, anytime you meet him, so anything pre two thousand seven, you could say, okay, you didn't really know he wasn't arrested. No one knows anything. Maybe you can have an argument that you didn't, you didn't know. Sure. Yeah. Anything, anything after that, you had. Any politician, you have staff. This is their only job to make sure the boss doesn't go and meet with someone that could end their political career. Yeah, I'm still waiting for that little black book yes. to surface. Yes. Uh, what's yeah, her name? Yeah. Ghislaine, uh yeah, Ghislaine Maxwell. Ghislaine, yeah, she... Netflix already just put a documentary out. It, it's Where's out there. the book? Where's the name? What's, what's it called, Nick? Uh, I, I don't know. I, I, I just I have to go. I have to. Is it like I, really recent? Yeah, yeah, it came out. I think it's out. It just came out in the last month, I think. Oh well, then hopefully oh. that'll get the ball rolling. For I, I have a, a feeling. Investigative journalist. Uh, I have a feeling we're, we're never. It's never going to see the light. There's of day. too many names. I think. I think someone with authority said, "When you get your hands on that book, we're going to destroy it." Who, who do you guys think would be the writer slash director to take on the Epstein movie? You know that's hard who, who, to say, but uh, they couldn't. They couldn't conclusively name names. It almost right. have to have sort of a fictional component because they could sure. probably get sued yes, yes. if of they course, even hint that they, existing they, people took that, part in that. So that, Tarantino, if that director <laughs> named names in the movie, you you, you know what's going to happen. But you you know you intimate at things. Yeah. You know, I think David Fincher could do it. Yeah. Think about this, what he did with the social network hmm. and showing the subtle uh, sociopathy of um, Zuckerberg. Yeah. 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 Anyway. <laughs> and, and you were talking about uh, Weinstein. You know, when when all was revealed about him, all of a sudden all these stories started surfacing that this had been going on for years, years, if not decades. Yeah. And it's like, who was suppressing this? Why? Was it because he was powerful? Because... He can make or break your career. Like, why was all this suppressed until all of a sudden the the dam broke and all this information came out? Who was responsible for protecting this guy all these years? Everybody who had something to lose because they'd made they they'd got in bed with them. Not hopefully not literally, but you know, metaphorically. In some cases, yeah. yeah. I mean, there are a lot of people that stepped down. the The MIT lab 
um, Ito, I think uh, he was on 60, 60 minutes. He he founds the, it's it's the I forgot the name of the lab. Uh, they basically any kind of future stuff that's going to get invented, the genius is there, dude, and he gets money, and they'd have to go through Weinstein or Epstein to to get it. So anyone associated with them had to start stepping down, and saying, "Oh, I didn't know about this stuff." I'm like, come on, bro, this is yeah. a joke. They got the emails to prove it. Wow, man. What else did you have? Did you were you going to bring something else to the table? Oh no, yeah. I mean, look, uh, when it comes to uh, political, um, just the political connections and scandals with Hollywood, some of them have. I hate. I mean, it's almost weird. You can break, you can commit a crime, but still do something good. And and I bring up the the case of Argo. Even though the movie took a lot of, you know, obviously some uh, uh, liberties. creative liberties. Yeah, 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 creative liberties. The 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 broad strokes were true that the CIA the CIA worked with Hollywood to craft a plan which felt like a Hail Mary to go get a, a few Americans out and, and out of uh, one of the, you know, one of the most dangerous situations that existed at the time. And, you know, they broke laws and there was corruption. There's people, you know, making all sorts of deals back and forth that would get people in trouble now. In fact, Reagan made a deal with the Iranians to hold hostages until after the election to further help beat Carter. I mean, yeah. so and then coincidentally they were released right after the election. Right. Yeah, what does that remind us of? Uh the last president getting impeached over uh Hunter Biden and uh, Ukrainian <laughs> information. Yeah. Fantastic. No, yeah. I, and Joe, you kinda mentioned this earlier that they'll never learn because it's every I've seen we've seen, we've all seen these new candidates say, I'm not a creature of Hollywood. You know, I'm not a creature of, of uh Washington. I'm gonna go there and change things. They all sound like Mr. Smith goes to Washington. Yeah. They and, all go in with good intentions. And all and then, their mentors, their first orientation, I think they did this on 60 Minutes. They show the, the House of Representatives, they come in there. The first orientation is you need to start raising money. Yeah, yeah, I heard similar stories where they go in, they're, they're, they're like, you have to make X amount of calls every day, yeah. and your quota is this. Like, it's money, 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 donations, donations, donations. I, I have a personal story with that. But that's for another day. Teasing the sequel. For, working for a congressman in, uh, in, on the south side of Houston when I lived there. Anyway. Yeah. But oh, that's, that's another story. Yeah, yeah imagine no, how. Ran for president a couple times. Wow. Yeah, imagine the dis- <laughs> disillusionment of, of, you know, wanting to change the world and, and getting elected. And you go to Washington and they give you this office and then they say, all right, you're going to spend X amount of your day making uh, soliciting campaign contributions that's got to be just heartbreaking like well, that's not what i signed up for but that's what it's all about mm-hmm. and for the people that come from the smaller districts it doesn't make any sense to me because you could pretty much know everyone you could just go to your house like joe it's me yeah. so i'm not i'm not going to be on the phone calling you you know it's me so when yeah. you hear stuff like hey you know you know, he had a dead, t- you know, a dead hooker in his in his trunk. You know, that's <laughs> they're, they're running negative ads against me. I didn't really yeah. do that. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I come back and see you later. Like Nick, a dead hooker. What, what what's going on with that, <laughs> Joe? I keep telling you. <laughs> but it said it in the campaign ad. Now you know the whole fundraising aspect uh, reminds me of uh, years ago. A friend of mine said, "You know what you need in your life, church." And I was like, I- "I'll give it a shot." So I joined a local church. I won't say which one it was. And what's the first thing they do when you walk in that door? They hand you a stack of envelopes uh, that you're supposed to fill with money and, and donate every time you come into church. What is it? A certain percentage of your Ten, income? 10%. Is it 10% of you, you your tithe, salary? You tithe for the Lord. And I'm like, that's not what I signed up no. for. And so, you know, politics the same way. Yeah. Like, what did I get myself into? And I would imagine... You either get out of it or you buy into it, and yes. uh, that's what uh, you have to go is. in with an exit strategy. Yeah, and you have to know that okay, hey, we're going to primary you. Do it. You, it's almost like the, I call it "man with the grenade syndrome." You pull the pins, you go in like, "Oh, hey, you're going, you're not going to get your seat. See these grenades? Yeah, I'm out in two years, so I'm going to do everything I can to make your life miserable." You, you know, you know who did that from the great state of Michigan the last yeah. 10, 12 years? Who's that? From Grand Rapids, Justin Amash. Amash, yeah. He he knew how to get out with hmm. leaving the Republican Party, then becoming a libertarian. Knew that he was getting redistricted, knew he was gonna lose and said So long, suckers. Wow. Um, Amash <laughs> walked that fine line. Like when you needed him on certain votes, then I was like, Well, I see your name on that bill that shouldn't be on there. But oh, then on, on, cer- on certain on certain on, on certain ones he would 
he would, you know, at least take a principal stand on it. But I was like, well, it's not going to matter there because it's, you know, this happened. This I see this happen a lot in, in in the Democratic Party too. That, you know, they'll say like, oh, I, but I stood against them. Like, yeah, but whether you voted for or against it, it wouldn't have mattered. Yeah, and and think about this. Imagine that you are a politician. You're 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 integrated into this machine, and you think, wow, this is wrong. And then somebody says. We will pay off all your debts. Yeah. We will pay off your mortgage. And I'm not, again, I don't want to name names here, but there are certain Supreme Court ju- uh, justices <laughs> who've <laughs> had <laughs> their entire debt wiped clean. Yeah. So, a, a qu- hey. A quarter mil. Yeah. And maybe the, the base, I can baseball buy into And this. the worst thing yeah. is you could you can request these because they're public officials and they'll present it to you and they... So they don't hide it. It's just, it's again like the cop thing. They mm-hmm. don't even hide That's it anymore. That's the arrogance of it all, yeah. They don't even hide it anymore. Now it's like, oh. As long as it's legal and, and you have some, some hot shot lawyers, you can do whatever you want. Mm-hmm. Yep. yep. I mean, it, it's, you know, they always talk about, you know, is D.C. corruption worse or New York corruption or Chicago or L.A. corruption? You know, it's almost like every city has their own, like, li- different type of taste. It's like wine. Oh, right. yeah. It's what, the, what what was your city founded on and what's its main industry? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like with Hoffa, he met the labor uh, union oh, auto. Yeah. Oh, sure. Uh, Where is the buck to Detroit, be made? Yeah. Like, he, he is the Detroit guy of, Yeah. I mean, even some of the great, the greatest known presidents of the United States, FDR, in 1939, the studios didn't want to be, but what was it? I think Joe, Joe, oh, the, I remember, the wealth the, of knowledge that that is. Uh, they that wanted is to Joe. keep the unions out. Yeah, yeah keep yeah. the unions out, and so they went to they went to FDR and said, "Hey, look, we're all struggling right now. Don't do this to us. We need to keep, you know, you don't want to do this when, when everyone needs a job." And so FDR backed off and gave them another decade. They didn't even mm-hmm. revisit this until like. 1938 or something and okay. then yeah. and so yeah just scratch my back i'll scratch yeah. your back and, i mean you could try yeah. to make a great case for it but after he's like look I, I guess i'm dealing with a bunch of stuff i don't need to deal with this too yeah because then yeah. you guys can start running ads and then like you said hollywood becomes is it the voice of the people or they change the voice of the people yeah you know, it's, like, it's like wag you know the the tail wagging the dog i mean yeah you know what that reminds me of um and they just came out with a movie that kind of touches on it. Prescott Bush in his coup attempt against uh, FDR. Oh, yeah. You, you, are you familiar? Mm-mm. No. <laughs> so that movie Amsterdam with Margot Robbie, Christian yeah. Bale, um, John David Washington. Yeah, it's I, a great I case. went and saw it. Critics hated it. I loved it. Hmm. Anyway, it has to do with uh, – so Prescott Bush is Bush Sr.'s – dad right yeah so w's grandfather mm-hmm. him and a couple of business leaders tried a fascist coup against fdr at the time because they th- he was a socialist mm-hmm. he's gonna take our money our oil money and then what happened after that nick oh no i haven't seen Amsterdam yet I, no I no no the the story the real life oh yeah the, no i mean true facts for FD, fdr you know he did actually he ended up winning prescott dropped his case i mean Wait, are you talking about the movie or the actual? No, the actual thing. And th- there, there was a uh, a general. I think he was in the Marines. His name was Smedley Butler. Oh, yes, oh, yes, Smedley. I yeah, yeah. Sm- Smedley refused to go along with it. Smedley actually wrote a bunch of. Yeah, he's he'd been in, Smedley Butler had been a uh, a corporal. Like he's been through the all levels of the United States military, where their military was deployed to the Philippines and deployed everywhere to take to basically to serve as a conquering force and all that kind of stuff and they wanted him to be the the new leader the new president he's like i'm not doing it and yeah yeah you know that seems to be a sort of a common uh thread that even rears its head today is we're so lucky that there's always like one or two people who refuse to go along when when we look at this recent uh uh, coup attempt recently if pence decided to go along with that uh trump would probably be president today and so then the joint chiefs uh would have to step in which i think he did behind the scenes what's his name uh general milley yeah um uh yeah um uh, yeah it's at first now, of course, when I need the name, it can't be. <laughs> I think it's John Milley. No, but uh, what happened was they. It, the concerning part was I was never too much worried that there would be an actual coup because it, I always looked at it this way: had something, God forbid, happened to the entire capital, I, they even made a show on this called Disney or Survivor, where yeah. you know, terrorist attacks. I saw the thing. first two seasons. The states and governors would have to vote in a new government. There'd be a temporary injunction, but then they'd vote a new government, and mm. you know, 
hopefully wouldn't be as corrupt and all that stuff. But uh, you'd also have to have the military, the FBI, yeah. and the CIA at minimum on your side, and no one in those organizations there is, there's, were going along with this. I remember the media overhyping certain things, but there were certain parts which they should have hyped, uh, f- focused on that they never mm-hmm. did. They, it's almost like weird. It's like it's like focusing on gout when you have cancer. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. like the weirdest thing you would focus on. Uh, that no one ever like focuses too much on the fact that the deal. Why did the DOD feel the need? Like, what general feels the need to send a memo out? Hey guys, remember we're going to do everybody be peaceful. We're a democracy. I'm like, mm-hmm. like why would you need to send that email out? Like, why yeah. would you need that letter to go out? Like, everyone T- should know that tonight our president is is doing a live speech about that same thing. Mm-hmm. So now he's addressing the American people directly. You know, and smaller things like this, like Michael Flynn, General yep. Michael Flynn, yep. has been going around and saying things, and no one ever looks at his brother who was in the military who was yes. basically kind of agreeing with certain yes. things that he did yeah it's yeah. Uh, uh, in, in the latest uh, committee hearings that we were talking about with the January 6th stuff why wasn't Mitch McConnell brought up there yeah mm-hmm. because now you see and again everyone can it's it's basically a Google search which you can use without going to some you know radical blog or something like <laughs> that but I mean multiple sources have confirmed that the three letter agencies con- told the Senate uh, sergeant of arms like hey listen we, we have credible that something bad could happen, be on your guard. I think mm-hmm. you should call the National Guard out. The Sergeant of Arms makes a request to the Senate Majority Leader at the time, which is Mitch McConnell, hey, can you please summon the National Guard? You have the authority to do that. We need extra protection here. We have credible evidence to please do it. He never did. Yeah. Well, the the plan, the ultimate plan from what I heard was, uh, <clears throat> and, and they were, you know, they did their homework on this, that if for some reason the certification of the election didn't take place, which was what the whole attempt of this this uh, riot was, that it ultimately would have been given to Congress to basically vote on the new president, which at the time had a Republican majority. Right. That was the ultimate goal, was right. to disrupt things enough to give it to Congress to uh, right. name a new president. And, and, and Joe, 140 been Republicans anarchy. voted yes, including and, some here in Michigan. And Joe, you yeah, exactly. And Joe, you mentioned stuff where at least people, no matter what the party is, stood by their, their ideals and, and, yeah. and their honor. In Arizona, when it came to the Maricopa <laughs> County election, the people who voted for Trump said, hey, listen, we can't find – if there is something, we'll find it. Mm-hmm. We can't find anything. You have to let this go. Yeah. yeah, And you yeah. won't. So some people stepped up. Um, yeah. Um, we got about 10 minutes left in the podcast. There was one more topic I wanted to bring up uh, with L.A.'s connection to politics. Uh, and this one's pretty massive when you think about the the ripple effects that sort of happened um, – in, in in the wake of this. So on June 5th, 1968, uh, Robert F. Kennedy, uh, he, just a day earlier, he had won the California and South Dakota primaries. Uh, he was sort of an underdog uh, for the presidential nomination, but once he won those primaries, he was on his way to he had all the momentum. being the guy uh, yeah. to represent the Democratic Party uh, for the next upcoming presidential election. Um but as he was making a speech at the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles, uh, he set on to Chicago, and uh, for some reason he was going one direction, and someone grabbed him, pulled him through the uh, the hall that led through the kitchen, and uh, Palestinian Sirhan Sirhan uh, shot him in the head at point-blank range, and uh, as they tackled him, he fired off eight shots, is what I heard from one uh, source. Four of them hit Kennedy, uh, one... Uh, Behind his right ear at point-blank range, two entered his back near his right armpit, uh, one in the back of the neck. Uh, lying on the floor, he asked, is everybody okay? And uh, and he went into unconsciousness, uh, was rushed to the hospital, and, and uh, died uh, in the hospital. Um, and so it was 26 hours after the shooting is when he, he died. Um, at the time, presidential candidates did not get Secret Service protection. Uh, they do now. Uh, and don't get me started on this whole Pelosi hammer situation thing. Right. That kind of pisses me off right there. Right. Um, now, uh, why why did Sirhan Sirhan do what he did? Well, they found a diary with entries in it saying that uh, RFK must die. And the reason is, again, I mentioned he was a Palestinian. He was angry that the U.S. and uh, Robert F. Kennedy supported Israel. 
and that was the main motive uh, for him to, they said he was hanging out at the ambassador. He knew that uh, Kennedy was going to be speaking there. He uh, loaded up on drinks and got the courage. And I don't know how he ended up in the right place at the right time in that kitchen yeah. hallway to get access to him, um, but yeah. there wonder, he was. I wonder if uh, Papa Bush was in town <laughs> then, too, uh, like he was uh, in and Dallas you know, in 1963. And again, we could go down a rabbit hole, but you, when you just say the, the known facts out loud, they sound categorically absurd. Yeah. And that's... Almost as if somebody planned this and wrote it out. In a and script. that's what leads to conspiracies. Like what was this Stephen. guy... How did he get access to the Democratic nominee for the president? And... Like I said, when you talk about the the ripple effects, uh, had Kennedy not died, likely he would have been the next president of the United States. Um, yeah. When yeah. he died, yeah. um, uh, who was it? Nixon. Uh, yeah. Well, Nixon ended up winning. Yeah. Uh, Hubert Humphrey became the Democratic Lyndon nominee. Lyndon Johnson wasn't going to run again. Yeah. Yeah, and so he lost to uh, Nixon. So you got to wonder if if RFK would have gone up against Nixon, would he have won the election? He would have beaten him just like his so. brother did. Yeah. So, yeah. So Kobe. Think, <laughs> yeah. So think about Absolutely. the implications of that assassination that turned like ah, I haven't the thought time about the Nixon line. angle. Yeah. Oh. And and the thing is, and you you can't put anything past Nixon and his staff. Absolutely. No. Nothing. nothing. But the, but the thing, I, uh, <laughs> what you know, look, the Kennedys aren't perfect. No one's here saying that they're angels or anything like that. Everyone, you know, this is not about that. But it's it's about when you talk about power and you talk about corruption. And you talk about the enemies that Kennedy made in the military. You know, I think uh, if you guys ever see 13 Days, Oliver Stone's film, mm -mm. No. it was about the Cuban Missile Crisis. Mm -hmm. You know, they were, and there are certain, you know, you can say there's dramatic liberties taken, but the, the core message was they were not happy with the Bay of Pigs. They didn't like that Kennedy oh, yeah. started, you know, wanted peace. Yeah, he said, I'd smash the CIA to a thousand pieces, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and and basically undo the work of the Dulles brothers, who, yeah. <laughs> yep. which, you know, those are, you talk about enemies that you don't want to make, and they had no problem making it, but. Yeah, look what they did to Iran yeah. in 1953. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, so here's a, a little shocking tidbit as I was doing my research. Sirhan Sirhan is still alive. Yes, he is. He's imprisoned in the Richard J. Donovan Correctional Facility in San Diego, California. He's been denied parole countless times. And most recently, in January of 2022, by California Governor Gavin Newsom. So he, the guy who killed RFK, is still sitting there in a. If he prison. got out, I wonder what legally he would be allowed to say. Yeah, you know. Well, he could say anything because he's a free. He's free at that point. But the question is, I've I, I've never actually looked into this. I'd just be curious if anyone knows. What has the Kennedy family ever said? Have they ever about, you know, said, "Look, we want him out so we can talk to him"? Maybe get like, "Why did you do it?" I think they just really sort of as... take it at face value. I mean, when you take into consideration his his uh, diary entries that he was just fixated on Robert Kennedy and and his mission in life was to kill Kennedy. I think um, they just take it at face value. And now Sirhan Sirhan claims he has no memory of it, and yeah. that starts bringing up the Manchurian candidate. Like, yeah. was he brainwashed to carry out this the... act? You know. I mean, I mean, it does. Okay, you can be upset about Palestine and Israel. Well, wow, the Sarah and Sarah must be really mad now at seeing how, yeah. what, what's been happening after the next you know forty years with that with that particular scenario. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, that that's your reason for doing it, and then he got pulled down the a random hallway at the last second. Yeah. So was if there's a credible threat, that was the audible. So he knew the audible in case they were changing. Like, oh, we received a credible threat. You know, uh, yeah. you know, you know, Mr. Kennedy. So we're going to pull you down this way. Uh, it's, it's... Yeah. yeah, it leads to all kinds of speculation and, and conspiracy. Now, the obviously, the L.A. connection is it, it happened um, at the Ambassador Hotel in Los mm -hmm. Angeles. And I got a couple of little uh, tidbits. Uh, the Ambassador Hotel was opened in 1921, and it was the place for the stars to hang out. A lot of them stayed there, and uh, they were home to the Coconut Grove, which at the time was probably the most famous uh, nightclub in the world, uh, where anyone who was anyone went to the Coconut Grove um, to be seen and to dance. And uh, the the decor in the Coconut Grove was set dressing from The Sheik, the movie yeah. The Sheik, starring uh, Rudolph Valentino. 
And if you looked up at the ceiling, there were stars twinkling in the ceiling to make it seem like it was an open, open air club. Uh, they hosted the second Academy Awards uh, in 1930 and six total uh, over the next 13 years. Uh, it closed in 1989. In 2001, the LA Unified School District purchased the property. It was mostly demolished between 2005 2006. They talked about trying to incorporate some elements into the school. I don't know if that ever happened. I think maybe a facade still stands. Um, and currently there are six schools on the property that are named the RFK, Robert F. Kennedy Community Schools. Uh, numerous, numerous films were shot at the Ambassador. Gene Harlow's 1933 film Bombshell. Forrest Gump, uh, almost famous. Apollo 13, Catch Me If You Can. Hoffa. Uh, that wow. thing you do, Pretty Woman, The Mask, uh, and one of my favorites, The Graduate, where uh, Dustin Hoffman yeah. rendezvous booze with uh, <laughs> with Mrs. Robinson. I, I love uh, that list of all these great movies, and then The Mask is thrown in there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. The Mask and The Wedding Singer, no. with Adam Sandler. Um, so very, very famous Hollywood location is um, the scene of one of the most tragic. Uh, incidents in American history. And that was such a, an awful time because you, we lost JFK, RFK, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X. We're all gunned down within span of just a few years of each other. But again, think of the ripple effects that came from this particular assassination and um, what it did to the course of uh, American history. And, yeah. and we all know what Nixon did when he got into office. He was not a good person. And, uh, you just got to wonder what if what if that had never happened what if he did what if he exited uh, where he thought he was going to exit instead of going down that kitchen hallway uh, you can point your finger at a number of of alternate outcomes my my ultimate conspiracy is that somehow um what was the guy's name who shot kennedy I'm drawing uh, a blank oh uh, uh, oswald Os oswald. oswald the first one yeah and sirhan sirhan were deeply jealous of the kennedy boys love for Marilyn Monroe hmm. and they had to take those boys out <laughs> that's that's all that's your theory that's huh? my theory ah I interesting mean, I mean the the notion of a Kennedy dynasty <laughs> probably scared the hell out of a lot of people back then, a lot of powerful people and I think that's what they did because you were looking 60 to 68 would have been John F. Kennedy 68 to 76 would have been or no yeah, 70, yeah. 76 would have been yes. RFK yeah if, if Things went and then and then exactly. and maybe that would have set them up because Ted Kennedy was going to run and yeah. he, you know he was running. so then that would have been a, a, until oh, his yeah. accident yeah yeah that would have been a string of Kennedys and that you know Joseph Kennedy's dream you know yeah. all three of my boys yeah now we only got a couple minutes left yeah. but you got me thinking about a uh, Stephen King uh, novel that uh, resulted in a mini series I think on Hulu or something uh, where James Franco plays a guy who goes back in time to try and prevent a JFK's yeah. assassination. Yeah. And uh, spoiler alert, when he finally does manage to do it, the outcome isn't quite what we thought. Oh, it's pretty pretty interesting take on whether the Kennedys were heroes or villains. And uh, who knows what, what would have come uh, right. had I mean, they survived those assassinations. I mean, people change, uh, circumstances change. There was a time where John F. Kennedy was willing to not back down from the Russians. And so, you know, fortunately, cooler heads prevailed. I mean, so who knows? But you're right. It's one of those inflection points. Yeah. And with that, that brings this episode of Hollywood Crime Scene to an end. Uh, get out and vote. If yes. you hear this before Election yes. Day, get out yes, and vote. Please. Take part in the process. Uh, you can't complain if you don't uh, get to the polls. Guys, Another fascinating conversation. I enjoyed it always. Yes. And uh, we'll see you guys again soon on an upcoming episode of Hollywood Crime Scene.